Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. Today, I am chatting with Maria Palmer about overcoming adversity and getting back to you. Really, really excited to jump into this conversation today. You are listening to Creating Wellness from Within, a podcast devoted to helping you live your best life through self-care and wellness. In each episode, we strive to offer you actionable advice and tools to help you on your journey towards greater personal wellness. I am your host, Amy Zellmer. I am editor-in-chief of Midwest Yoga and Life and author of the Chair Yoga Pocket Guide, available on Amazon. I am passionate about all things yoga, wellness, photography, travel, and all things glittery. You can learn more about me at creatingwellnessfromwithin.com. Today's guest is Maria Costanzo Palmer, and she is a writer and Page Turner Award finalist for her co authored Amazon best selling book, On the Rocks The Prima Donna Story, which currently has a non exclusive shopping agreement for film and TV rights. She was recently named as one of the top 15 rising authors to watch by LA Weekly and was mentioned in Forbes magazine. A former host on LA Talk Radio, she has made a number of media appearances. Growing up as the oldest child of an award-winning restauranteur, Palmer unexpectedly became a daughter of the incarcerated. This experience ignited an interest in working for Get on the Bus, a nonprofit dedicated to uniting children with their incarcerated parents. Welcome to the podcast, Maria. So happy to have you here. Thank you, Amy. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to dive into all of these issues. And I too am a very big yogi. So that's very exciting to me. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like everybody needs to have yoga in their life and the world will be a better place. (laughs) A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yes. So Maria, where would you like to start with this conversation? I feel like there's a lot to dig into. Um, So I'm happy to start wherever you would like. Yeah, sure. So I'll give everybody a little background on me and, you know, how I, I grew up and we can kind of go from there if that works for you. Great. So I grew up outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, in a small little city called McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania, uh, which kind of butts up against the the city of Pittsburgh. And nobody had ever heard of this town before until last year, the Buffalo Bills star, Jamar Mm. Hamlin, collapsed on the um, field. And he is, in fact, from McKees Rocks and his mother's daycare that I think he's raised over $9 million for at this point shares a back alley with what once was my father's restaurant, the Prima Donna. And so I grew up in a restaurant family. My dad was a young postal worker, and he always had this dream of opening up a world-class restaurant, but he really didn't have the money to back that dream. So he bought a failing business in McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania, and slowly but surely, with a lot of struggle, turned it into one of America's hottest Italian restaurants. And this was back before the time where we had things like Zoom and YouTube, Facebook and Instagram, um, really word of mouth. And most of the hot restaurants at that time were coming out of New York or San Francisco, Miami, Chicago. It was rare to have something kind of come out in a a smaller to mid-sized city like Pittsburgh. Um, But he made it happen just from basic relationship making, got a really big review in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, and that sort of was the engine that turned everything to a go. Um, At the height of the restaurant, we had celebrities and sports stars and people that would kind of filter in and out, um, won many national and international awards. And then at the height of it all, I received a knock on my door and it was federal agents looking for my father. And somebody had mentioned his name in a federal grand jury investigation which automatically became a criminal investigation and not a civil one. And for the next few years, um, we were investigated and he eventually 
pled guilty to tax evasion charges and went to prison for five months. And so my story is one where I was, it was, this was completely unexpected. Uh, my dad was not at all a person of interest. Uh, if anything, he was sort of the pillar of the community. He hired people within McKee's Rocks and helped to kind of turn their economic worlds, up, up, you know, on the upswing. Um, he believed in all of the community programs there, did a lot of good for the community itself. And then all of this happened. And so I kind of hopped on a plane at that point and moved 3,000 miles away to Los Angeles, California, because we all know that if you have problems and you just get on a plane, then they just don't follow, <laughs> right? Right, right. <laughs> of course, couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and whenever I got out to LA, I really was having a lot of trouble um, grounding myself finding my my footing, figuring out what the next step was for me and, and kind of coming to terms with all that had happened in my, my young life as a 20-year-old. And so luckily I met this nun, Catholic nun, um, who was doing a presentation at a church that we were kind of interested in, in going to. And she talked about this organization that she had started called Get on the Bus that brought children to go visit their incarcerated parents for Mother's Day and Father's Day. And I was so moved by what she had to say. She said she started the organization based upon knowing that the women at the prison didn't get any visitors. And so she was going to bring a Catholic delegation of women to visit the women at Chowchilla Women's Prisons. And they said, why would we have all these strangers visit us whenever our own children have never visited? And it right, had been, right. I think, between four and 17 years um, between the time that they had seen their children. So she brought that first bus in 1999, and the rest is history. And so I started um, just on, on a voluntary basis, going with her and presenting my story to people, um, cause as she said, you know, we can take you to Pasadena or we could take you to South Central, um, regardless people will connect with, you know, what your story is and resonate with it. And, um, on a fluke, her director ended up quitting and I ended up taking over and what happened next. I know that we're talking all about healing and wellness today. But I thought at that point, I was going to be the person that was going to change all these lives. And I was going to be the person that was going to make everything better. And really, that is whenever the real healing started for me. The families that we were serving helped me. They helped me right. realize things like unconditional love and forgiveness and how to move on whenever you have so much shame and guilt in your life. And that became the beginning pillar to a long journey back to me. And, you know, that that journey has consisted of many other things, but I would say that that was the start. Wow. And so when your dad, um, well, let's back up even when, when the FBI knocked on your door, uh, you were what, about 20? 20, yeah. Yeah, I was actually in between jobs. I, I We were always very hardworking people and I um, had summer internships and then I would work in the evening at my dad's restaurant. And I was kind of in between, I think, my lifeguarding job and my, my dad's restaurant job. And I had a knock at my door and it was two federal agents um, flashing badges asking for my dad. And initially, I thought that somebody had died. So it was mm. really scary because um, that's what you see in the movies, right? But yes, right. Whenever they reassured me that that was not the case and that they just needed to speak to him. Honestly, I wasn't um, at all wary that they were thinking about coming after him. I thought it would be somebody that he had known because when you own a restaurant to that degree. We had about a million people come through our doors between 1986 and whenever he closed in the early 2000s. So if you think of a million people, I mean, not many people have come in contact with a million people over their lifetimes or know a million people pretty intimately over their lifetimes. But 
whenever you own a restaurant like that, you do know all of these people and you know a lot of good people, but you know a lot of other people too that kind of come in and out. And so I really wasn't even thinking that it was anything about him, but whenever we found out that it was, it was certainly, like I said, a very hard blow um, to my mental health. And, um, you know, I, I lived in a state of just almost stages of grief at that particular moment. And it was hard for me to even walk down in the, on the street in LA and talk to people because I thought for some reason, if I opened my mouth, people were going to say things like there's something wrong with that girl. And, you know, it's, I'm here to definitely say if anybody's listening and they feel like that, please know that that's not the case, that um, nobody from the outside can tell what you're going through on the inside. It, It doesn't mean that you shouldn't get help because you should, and you should find somebody to talk to even if it's um, a close friend or a family member, anybody that could help you, a therapist, um, but know that that's not how the outside world is perceiving you. That's how you're perceiving yourself. And that's something that I did not know at that time. And I mean, I can see why you chose to move. Like you live in a small town, everybody knows everybody. And I'm sure you had some of the... um, you know, like everybody's must be staring at me because they know about my dad, right? Like I get that. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I grew up in a small town. I get it. Everybody's in everybody's business. Um, So how how did, what were your feelings towards your dad when this happened? Like, were you mad at him or did you not really care or um, no? what what were Yeah, I, it wasn't anger or anything like that. It was just, um, I was scared. I was scared for him and I was scared for us. I was in shock, but I think everybody was in shock. Um, And, you know, if you're in a white collar crime-esque family, right? these are things that are expected to happen. But whenever you're not, whenever my dad was just a small business owner that happened to use all of his own resources and blood, sweat, and tears to make his place a premier facility in in the United States. And when that happens, obviously, there's a little bit of jealousy that comes with that, um, with other, other people. But you also become low hanging fruit because the person that did mention his name and if in the federal grand jury investigation was doing so, so they could get their get out of jail free card. So, I mean, to a way I understand it. I, I don't like what we went through at all, but I understand why it happened in the way that it did. And I think that that's part of the yogi in me too, is, you know, being okay to let things go or to Mm -hmm. have complete empathy um, for maybe somebody else that didn't make the best decision in the moment. Um, So yeah, I was just more scared for him, scared for us. Um, You know, the, the uncertainty of everything, I think, made me more anxious than whenever everything was decided. Whenever everything was decided, it had an end point. Whenever there's so much uncertainty with, oh, it could go this way or it could go this way, or we're going to look yeah. into this, this, and this, that, that to me is crazy making. And that's what drives my personal anxiety. And I'm sure other people can relate to that as well just the uncertainty Mm -hmm. of life sometimes is really challenging yeah absolutely um so you know you moved out to LA it sounds like you stayed there (laughs) um and I did for a time um I'm back on the east coast now oh you are outside outside of New York City I'm I'm just an east coast girl at heart but I was I was in LA for almost 10 years so yeah. Um, you know, I definitely had my, my dose of it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so what helped you, um, you know, begin 
to like, like you said, you know, you're walking on the street and you think everybody can see inside you and what you're going through, you know, what, what helped you get through that and, and to the other side of that? Well, I think first working or get on the bus was very helpful. Like I said, because the family members of the people that we were serving helped me a lot. Um, you know, they helped me to learn the lessons that I really couldn't absorb on my own at the time. Um, also being in a position where I was doing something to help other people that helped a lot too. So, um, my job, even my job currently, I I still work in the nonprofit field. And whenever you work in the nonprofit field, you go to bed every night and you're grateful at the fact that you were able to do something to better somebody's el- somebody else's life circumstances. And that in itself, I think, is very healing. Um, I did eventually find yoga uh, a little later on in the journey. I wish I had that always. Um, and right. running. <laughs> I, I would say earliest in the journey, I did a lot of running. I ran a couple of marathons and I'm not an athletic person by any stretch of the imagination. I was always the kid that got picked last in gym before you weren't allowed to do that anymore. <laughs> I actually dreaded it. It was my, my absolute worst, um, course in school. I was a really good student, but very uncoordinated and very clumsy. And I don't know. It just like to this day, I can't go into a gym. I have like heart palpitations. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, I did train myself and I did two marathons. I did the um, CIM marathon in Sacramento and I did the Los Angeles marathon as well. Um, So that was kind of part of it, like using that cortisol and the, the adrenaline for something else. Um, yoga also became a really big piece of it. And, you know, with yoga, as you know, Amy, you're constantly challenging yourself and you're constantly bringing everything onto the mat and knowing that in life things get really hard, but they don't last. And the only thing that's constant is the change of what's going on around Mm -hmm. us. So Mm-hmm. knowing how to push through those changes and also knowing when to call the himsa, right? And say like, okay, this is too much. I need to back off right now. I don't want to create any kind of self-harm. And, you know, that was really helpful. Um, talk therapy has been incredibly helpful. Uh, CBT, I would say, is very, very helpful. Cognitive behavioral therapy um, and just kind of dispelling those thoughts that go through our heads, because sometimes all of those what ifs, first of all, many of them never even surface to be what will be, but we always have those right. what ifs, right? So learning how to stop them and dispel them, and sometimes just to ground yourself, I think that that was also a really crucial piece of the puzzle. And then you know, to have that unconditional love of people around you. I'm lucky enough to have a wonderful family, um, both uh, chosen and and given to me, uh, and a wonderful group of friends and supporters that um, are just there for me no matter what. You know, I still have friends that I grew up with and friends from college, and, you know, they kind of have folded into becoming my tribe and my, my yoga people too, are just incredible. So, um, you know, knowing that you don't have to have a million friends, but the ones that you have should treat you like you're one in a million and you should obviously reciprocate in that same way. But, um, you know, that all all of those things were, I think, really helpful in, in my healing for sure and continue to be helpful. So I want to make sure we take a moment to mention your website, which is mariacpalmer.com. And wherever you're listening, we have a clickable show link for you. So you can click through to that. Um, But tell us a little bit about what we can find on your website. I'm sure we can find your book there, right? Um, And where else can we find your book? Yeah, absolutely. So on my website, there's all kinds of information about um, how to kind of follow along in my journey, my 
uh, social media pages, obviously the book. Um, the book is really wherever books are sold, Amazon, Target, Barnes & Noble. Um, it's also in a lot of physical stores, but it, if it's not in the store that you go into, they can certainly order it for you because it's uh, through Ingram distribution. Um, other things that you'll find on my website is obviously all of these media clips that I'm doing. Um, Amy's show will also surface on my website as soon as it uh, comes out. Um, all the events that we do, we have all kinds of really fun creative events um, because my book is about a restaurant and a restaurant tour. We our latest thing is we're doing cook and book events. So we mm, very go cool and cook for about an hour, make a, you know a recipe from the restaurant, and then we sit down for a really nice lunch and or dinner um, and a book discussion and signing opportunities and photo ops. Um, and that has been a huge success. I do lots of signings, podcasts, um, TV, you know, you name it. Um, and we're going to start in the Pittsburgh area very soon, probably in the spring, doing quarterly prima donna nights. So bring back the prima donna food um, but just in a, a quarterly kind of situation because my dad is now 70 and not in the best health and I'm not living locally in the area. So we're doing what we can with the resources that we have, but we are just so grateful to everybody who's followed along. Mm, I love that. That's really cool. Well, Maria, thank you so much for being here today and for sharing your story and, um, you know, anyone who is interested in your book, On the Rocks, The Prima Donna Story, um, can find it, like you said, on your website, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, most, most places where you buy books. So thank you, Maria, so much for being here today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Amy. It's been wonderful. And thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Please consider leaving a five-star review wherever you are listening to help others on their own wellness journey discover this podcast. Also, head over to MidwestYogaLife.com and sign up to receive information on the magazine and the upcoming Midwest Yoga Conferences. Thank you all for listening. Have a great day, everyone, and I will see you in the next episode.